A few years ago, I was at a Goodwill looking for, you know, the stuff you look for in a Goodwill. I used to be pretty into photography, so every time I went to the thrift store, I flipped through the piles of point-and-shoot film cameras and VHS camcorders, hoping to find some forgotten treasure. On this occasion, I picked up an item on a whim, thinking it was a film movie camera. 8 and 16 millimeter cameras show up often enough, so that's what I figured it was. But this thing had a cable hanging off the back that was permanently attached with a weird connector on the end that I didn't recognize. So, obviously a video camera, but of a sort I had never seen before. I was surprised with all my reading about video history that I didn't know what it was. There's a good chance you don't either. Most people I've met don't. You may have noticed from some of my work that I'm interested in vintage video cameras. There's a bunch of reasons to be fascinated by them. Uh, early video has the look, of course, plus the technology is extremely arcane, and that should be enough for anyone. But there's one particular element that I find most fascinating, and that's what has simply been forgotten about it all. What do you think of when you think of the concept of video camera? If you're younger, you might think of one of these. Someone out there probably thinks some young people watching this imagine a smartphone, but I doubt it. I think this is what video camera is to just about anyone. It's a single purpose device that you just hit record on. If you're a bit older, you might think of one of these, or even one of these. They're the same thing, but instead of a memory card, you put a tape in it. Even if you think about professional cameras, it's probably about the same thought. You hold it in your hand, or you put it on your shoulder, it has a battery and something to record on, and that's that. There's an interesting blind spot that we all have about this, though. I said video camera, and we all thought of these devices, but these used to more commonly be called camcorders. Now, if I'd said camcorder, you would have made the same connections, but not all video cameras are camcorders. This, for instance, is a broadcast camera that has no recording capability of its own. It just produces video, which gets carried away on a cable and recorded somewhere else. Now, if you don't work in television, all the video cameras you've ever seen were probably camcorders. And if you watch a YouTube clip or read an article about the history of home video, you'll probably only see camcorders. But did you ever wonder why we have this word? It clearly means camera recorder, but why did someone see a reason to make up a word for that? Wouldn't video camera have been good enough? Most summaries of video history that I've seen give no explanation for where this word came from. They'll mention some early events in video history maybe, sometimes starting in the very early days, sometimes in the Betamax era, but then the camcorder just materializes, fully formed out of nowhere, sometimes in 84, sometimes in 83, with no real explanation of how it evolved. That's an odd thing to leave out, and I didn't notice it was so odd until I found this camera in the store that was most decidedly not a recorder. When I started trying to figure out what it was all about, I found that people have been leaving out gobs of history when they talk about home video. So let's go over some of the bullet points in the timeline of home video, and we'll see what's missing. Now, before we get into video itself, I should briefly tell you what it was trying to displace when it was invented. Film photographs and movies predate video, after all, and even if you're relatively young, you might know that people used to make home movies many, many decades ago, especially because it's something that used to come up in Hollywood movies pretty often. Sharing so much joy and cheer, what a wonder. Film home movies are in fact very old technology. People could buy home movie cameras at least as far back as 1923, and throughout the 40s and 50s and 60s, film home movies on the 16 and 8mm film formats were plenty popular. Something that might come as a bit of a surprise, if you think about it, is that a lot of these movies were in color, even back when a lot of people were taking photos in black and white. Kodak was selling Kodachrome color movie film in the 1930s, and actually all the ripped home movie footage I found on YouTube is in color, so I guess it was pretty popular. But, of course, there were frustrations with film. Obviously, you had to develop it, and development wasn't easy or cheap. The way Hollywood did it was a massive industrial process, for instance, and I imagine kind of the same thing was going on on a smaller scale for home movies. The developer is pumped through stainless steel pipes from a large circulation tank. The developer is maintained in strength by replenisher added to this tank. After development, the film passes into the hypo compartment, where the unexposed silver bromide is removed. The film is now dried, and here we see the processed negative emerging from the darkroom into a current of warm, dry air. Note the sensitometric strips. Another problem is that film moved pretty fast through the camera, so you didn't get much shooting time before you had to change spools. Usually home movie cameras were limited to film strips of only about three to four minutes, at which point you had to stop and laboriously change film reels before you could shoot again. And, of course, you couldn't see what you just shot for days or weeks while you waited for development. 
These problems applied to broadcast television as well. In the very early days of television, all TV shows were performed live, which meant they often had to do two shows, one for the East Coast and then another for the West three hours later. Eventually, the network started recording the first performance so they could play it back for the West Coast airing, but there was a problem with that. TV shows were shot electronically, so they were never stored anywhere, just sent straight out to the broadcast station. There was no electronic means of delaying the show, so as the East Coast performance was occurring, a machine called a kinescope recorded the broadcast picture onto movie film, and when it was done, they had to send it out for processing as quickly as possible, so it would be ready to play back using a different and very complex machine called a telecine, three hours later when the West Coast airing was scheduled to occur. This whole arrangement was extremely expensive. It burned through gobs of film on a daily basis, and the networks wanted to put an end to the waste by inventing an all-electronic means to record shows. Magnetic tape was a mature technology for storing audio signals, so naturally that's where they turned. The first point on our timeline, in 1951, is when the first attempts to record video onto magnetic tape were made by engineers at Bing Crosby Enterprises. It was a challenge because what they were storing on tape was an entire television signal, the same thing that got sent to a broadcast station, and those signals had a 1 MHz bandwidth, which was much larger than the roughly 44 kHz audio signals being stored on tape at the time. They did get a recorder working, but it was far from adequate. It ran at several hundred inches per second, or 20 miles per hour, and the image quality was terrible, so they shelved the idea for a few years to work on it. In 1956, their research paid off, and the first practical videotape, Quadruplex, was delivered by the Ampex Corporation. This was an open reel tape, meaning that it was on a big reel just like audio tape, and you had to thread the tape through a gigantic machine, through the heads, and onto a take-up spool. It was also two inches wide, compared to audio tape at one quarter inch wide, so with the combination of width and travel speed, these tapes were gigantic and inconvenient, but they were reliable, reusable, and high quality, and that's all the networks needed. So this format was successful, and they ended up using it for decades. This kicked off a whole series of developments in the broadcast industry that we don't really need to get deep into because we want to focus on home video here, but there's one more significant bullet point that we'll include on our timeline. In 1969, U-Matic was released, which is important here because it was the first cassette video format, meaning the tape was inside a plastic shell instead of on separate reels, and when you put one into a machine, it was threaded into the mechanism automatically. The name came from the U-shape that the tape made around the playhead. Sony wanted to market this to the public, but it didn't really make any headway that I'm aware of. In the commercial market, though, it did gangbusters, because it made things much easier for television studios. Instead of having to store and handle these huge reels of loose tape, they just popped a cartridge into a machine the size of a microwave oven and hit record. That made the handling of recorded video in large quantities, or in remote locations, a lot easier. This was monumentally important, because television news was completing its switchover to something called eyewitness news. It's the only type of news that exists now, but early TV news was entirely studio-based. It was just talking heads reading off stories from paper. Eyewitness news was all about being on the spot, reporting directly from the scene of an event, which meant shooting video in the field of things like hurricanes and police shootouts. Unlike open reel tape, which had to be delicately handled and used these enormous machines, pneumatic was compact and could be treated roughly in the heat of the moment without much risk of damage. Cassettes would go on to offer these same advantages to consumers, so this is worth putting on our timeline. So up to this point, all we have on this timeline is important events in commercial video. There's nothing about consumers here, just television networks. They invented this stuff for their own use, so this isn't too surprising. The history of consumer video, according to most accounts, usually begins a little later, in the mid-70s, with two big celebrated events. The first is in 1975, when Betamax, another cassette format, was released in the U.S., the major selling point that most accounts recall was that people could record television shows to watch later, instead of being glued to the TV and forced to follow its scheduling whims. This kicked off a new era of consumer control over television, and also resulted in lawsuits that set crucial precedent guaranteeing that consumers could record TV like that, which became known as time shifting. This is heralded as the most significant event in consumer video history, and I don't even dispute that point. Next, in 1977, VHS was released in the US, and while it wasn't a technological marvel compared to beta, it brought some important changes, mostly greater running time, which was critical for what people were mostly using it for, which was recording TV movies and sports broadcasts. Fish. But we're missing the big football Relax. game. Relax! My VHS home video recorder is taping it right now. It's over three hours. Relax! Panasonic VHS tapes up to four hours of sports, movie specials on one cassette. This, of course, also sparked the Beta vs. VHS Wars, which is a story you've probably heard several times already, but, spoiler warning, VHS won. So after all that, here's the big camcorder event. In 1983, the Sony Beta movie was released. 
This was the first camcorder ever sold to the public, and it was a fascinating technical accomplishment. Technology Connections has a terrific video on it that I'll link in the description so you can see the details about how it worked. But in short, the technology was so advanced that it wasn't quite done yet. They couldn't play back video, only record it. To play back your recorded footage, you had to take your tapes home and put them in a big stationary player. So while this was the first camcorder, according to almost all historical perspectives, it was arguably kind of a beta. In 1984, however, the JVC video movie was released, and that would go down in history as the first camcorder with the complete modern feature set. It could record and play back video with no external equipment, making it a true portable television studio. Yes, I am going to run the clip. A portable television studio. So this is a very neat, orderly timeline, but it's never really portrayed like this. People make videos and articles about bits and pieces of this history. Techmon has covered all kinds of videotapes, Tech Connections has talked about that first beta movie, and of course the VHS and beta story has been done to death, but I pretty much never see a concise beginning-to-end coverage like this. When you actually line everything up this way and take a look at it, a couple weird gaps show up. First, there's 20 years between the commercial realization of videotape and the release of the first home video format. Doesn't that seem odd to you? On how fast technology was moving and how quickly things were being turned into consumer products, doesn't that seem a bit slow? There's also almost 10 years between the release of the first home video format and the first video camera that used it, and that doesn't seem right. Certainly, the use of Betamax to record television shows was its overwhelming primary application, and in histories about home video, that's pretty much what the focus is on, and I don't really blame anyone for that. But did they really not give anyone a way to record original video for nearly a decade? It's hard to believe that the industry would have waited that long to turn videotape into something a consumer could buy, or that they wouldn't have sold video cameras for use with their incredibly popular videotape machines, yet neither of these things ever seems to get mentioned when I read about this history. This video wouldn't exist if I wasn't about to tell you that this timeline was incomplete, of course, but it's actually very incomplete. There's several tremendous milestones missing from it. Whether they had that much ultimate impact on culture is debatable, but they still belong there, and I feel obligated to fill in these gaps. So, let's go for it. The first two holes in the timeline are in 1965. Number one is when Sony released the first successful home videotape machine, the CV2000, which recorded video on half-inch open reel tape, just like a scaled-down version of what was being used by broadcasters. It was black and white, and it only recorded half the vertical lines of the TV image due to bandwidth limitations, but it produced a usable picture, so it invalidates the timeline all on its own, because it was sold as a way to record broadcast television shows, which means that time-shifting, the supposed great game-changer of the Betamax, did not begin in 1975. It began 10 years earlier, right here. And don't miss that word I used, successful. This was not a flash in the pan, it actually sold. You can find them on eBay once in a while, and a bunch of contemporary literature mentions this specific model. On top of that, there had actually been other video recorders marketed before it, which didn't sell so well. These included the Sony PV100 and Philips EL3400, which were sold between 62 and 64. Those were much larger, recorded on bigger tape, and cost a lot more, so they were probably purchased almost entirely by commercial customers, but they could have been, and probably were, purchased by a few wealthy enthusiasts. The CV2000, on the other hand, was a much more reasonable $700, so I'm sure it made its way into a significant number of households. I'll allow that the Betamax was quite superior when it came out, and more generally acceptable to the public. It was color and cassette-based and basically full resolution, but I promise you there were enthusiastic dads with too much money who bought these early recorders, so the timeline ought to start here. The second forgotten event in 1965 is when Sony sold the first successful home video camera. Home users could purchase it with the CV2000, enabling them to create their own videos from scratch. Now, this was not a small machine. The carrying cases illustrate that getting this to an event was more like moving an anti-tank gun than just bringing an extra gadget along. That, combined with the need for AC power, meant that although Sony suggested recording parades and other public events, you would have needed to plan ahead considerably to ensure you had juice available wherever you were going to shoot, plus a sturdy card table for the none-too-light recorder. Still, this alters our timeline substantially again by pushing back the appearance of the first original video shot by an amateur by nearly 20 years. I don't know how many of these sold either, but they do pop up on eBay, and what matters is that they existed, anyone with the money could have one, and it wasn't a one-off. Still, they admittedly probably didn't sell a ton, given the tank-like demeanor of the machine. There's only so much the average American wants to record in their living room, or without straining their back. Not much later, however, in 1967, the model that has the most significant impact on our new timeline was released, the DV2400. It was derived from the same technology as the CV2000, with the same format and specifications, but one monumental difference, which is that you could carry it around with you. 
The recorder was much smaller and it had a battery pack, so you could sling it over your shoulder, walk outside, and point the camera at anything you liked. This gave it its name, the Video Rover. For some reason, the term porta pack was also used by a lot of people to refer to this device, and although I can't figure out where that started, the term actually went on to become universal for portable video recorders for years afterwards. There were limitations to the Rover as well, just like the beta movie. You couldn't play back your video out and about to see what you captured. You had to take it home and play it on your home machine. You couldn't even automatically rewind the tape in this machine. There was a detachable hand crank for that purpose. But still, take a look at the magazine ad. Sony shows a man hanging out of a tree shooting video, and you really could do that with this machine. So, inconvenient or not, this is definitely the beginning of the fully portable era of video. This is the start of the through line that ends with us whipping our smartphones out to record cats being cute and planes crashing and police brutality. It all starts right here, not 1983. Another important thing to remember is that while this machine was big and clunky compared to a movie camera, you could shoot an hour of video on one tape. That's the equivalent of 18 film reels. Yeah, it wasn't in color, but you also didn't have to plan your shots. You could just leave the thing running, and if you decided you didn't like any of the footage, just rewind and record right over it. And that was, in fact, a selling point. Sony produced these machines for a couple years before moving on to a new model for 1969, the AV3400, also known as the Video Rover 2, and this is actually the most influential event on this timeline. Up until this point, videotape recorders, or VTRs as they were called at the time, had been entirely proprietary machines. Sony was competing with a few other manufacturers at this point, like Akai and Panasonic, but none of them could reliably interchange tapes or cameras. In 1969, all the manufacturers in Japan got together and agreed that their machines should be able to play the same tapes, and to this end, they settled on a standard which they called EIAJ-1, that's Electronics Industry Association of Japan, by the way. It still used the half-inch tape that most manufacturers had been using, but it was now recording with identical signals between all manufacturers and at full television resolution, although it was still black and white. Remember, however, that at this time, color television and color film were still not completely universal, so it was probably not seen as that harsh a limitation. I happen to own an AV3400, and 51 years later it still works, which is a testament to its build quality. But let's look at some footage. This video was recorded on the AV3400 with a somewhat period-accurate camera. It probably looks pretty sad to your eyes, the cameras that time were fairly primitive, and it performs better in sunlight or studio lighting anyway. But now, look at this clip. This was recorded on the same machine with a late 2000s solid-state camera, and it looks about as good as VHS, just black and white. This illustrates that home video shot at this time was probably kind of rough, though usable, but for recording television, the other function these machines were sold for, they probably performed pretty well. In addition to tape intercompatibility, the EIAJ standard seems to have produced a de facto connection standard as well. Prior to this, cameras were generally designed to work with a specific recorder or model line of recorders, and since the cameras had no built-in batteries, they needed more than just a video connection back to the recorder, and every model used its own unique plug. Starting with the EIAJ standard, pretty much every recorder settled on a common connector with a fairly reliable pinout, sometimes referred to as an EIAJ plug, which you'll recognize as the one on that camera I found that sent me down this rabbit hole to begin with. This connector got used on nearly every recorder and camera for about 15 years, and it was consistent enough that just about everything would plug into everything else. So that fills in the real prehistory, the stuff that came before anything modern, and that was a pretty big gap in the timeline. Not only video, but portable video started out in the 60s, and there was a whole mature industry producing product after product even before the end of the decade. Of course, the machines of this early era were fairly alien to our eyes. The most obviously strange thing about them is the open reel tape. I had simply never in my life conceived a videotape ever coming in a non-cassette form until I started researching this topic, but that would eventually change, while the other thing that makes these strange wouldn't change for much longer. That would be the separate camera and recorder design. From 65 to 83, nobody figured out how to make a combined camera and recorder, but they were still advancing the technology. While the beta movie was the first combined cassette recorder, it wasn't the first cassette recorder, period. Not long after VHS hit the market, portable recorders were sold that used it, but they were still separate units you carried on a shoulder strap. One of the first was the JVC HR4100 in 1978, and we can put that on the timeline too. You can see here that these portable VHS recorders weren't much smaller than the battleship-sized home units they had in the 70s. While Betamax was smaller, and maybe could have made a smaller machine, Sony was actually late to the portable market. They didn't have a portable beta recorder until the SL3000 in roughly 1979 or 1980. I hardly ever see portable beta decks, so I suspect Sony never really broke into this market at all in the end. A couple years later, with the camcorder looming on the horizon but not yet quite available, JVC developed the compact VHS format, which was simply VHS in a smaller package. You could actually put it in an adapter to play it in a normal VHS deck. This was intended to improve the size and weight situation, which it did, although the separate camera and recorder still looked pretty awkward to use in my eyes. 
Although maybe the awkwardness I'm feeling is just from the turbo creep they advertised it with. My new JVC Compact VCR is the world's smallest, lightest VCR ever. It's ideal for taping graduation, school plays, Halloween. <laughs> it's loaded with features. Perfect for Christmas morning, Groundhog Day, Little League, Big League. JVC's new compact VHS video system with the world's smallest, lightest VCR ever. Buzz off, Buster. Great sound, too. To close out my summary of the pre-camcorder era, I'll bring up a fascinating artifact from JVC. The SFP3 was sold in 1983, and it was simply a plastic frame into which you could dock their existing recorder and camera to assemble a camcorder. These components were the same ones we saw in a commercial earlier, being used separately with a connecting cable, and JVC just built this rig with an internal cable that made them act like one unit. This came out the same year as the beta movie, presumably as an attempt to become competitive as quickly as possible, and intriguingly, buried on their website, JVC claims this is the first camcorder ever made. I haven't been able to confirm exactly when they released it in Japan, but now you know there's contention for Beta Movie's claim of number one. Now, the camera I showed you at the beginning of this video was an early 80s model that was sold with a VHS recorder unit, and what's most interesting about that to me is that it still uses the same 10-pin socket they developed in 1969. You can plug it into an open reel recorder from the 60s, or plug a 60s camera into an 80s deck and they'll work together. I've tested this, and it works. In fact, this plug was so commonplace that it showed up on editing gear. I own a video switcher and effects unit that has three 10-pin sockets on the back for connecting cameras instead of composite input jacks, because it was extremely rare that someone would have a camera with composite out at the time this was made, but every consumer camera had a 10-pin plug. I even have a video title generator with the same connector on the back. That's somehow the thing that hits me hardest about all this, learning that there was this universal interconnect standard used for nearly two decades that was as common in home video as the yellow RCA jack would be in later years, and that must have been recognizable to millions of people at some point that's just faded into history. It never shows up even in lists of legacy video connectors nowadays, Wikipedia doesn't even have a page for it, and I've never seen a tech YouTuber show off a VCR with an EIAJ plug, although Tech Connections does mention the concept of the separate camera and recorder offhand in his video on the beta movie. It's even more impressive when you realize just how late this ran. The invention of the camcorder didn't immediately kill separate camera recorder combos. I can find cameras for sale at least as late as 1985, my title generator is from 1987 and it still has the 10 pin plug, and there's a ton of compatible gear on eBay. We're virtually knee deep in used DIAJ gear, yet in a society that overwhelmingly seems to remember what a Centronics printer plug is, nobody seems to know what an EIAJ plug is. It just blows my mind. <laughs> So to sum up this new information and how it affects our view of history, here's the new timeline. It looks pretty different than our old one, and there's a lot more action going on. 1965 is where home video started, 67 is where fully portable video started, 1969 is when the industry established universal standards, and 78 brought portable cassette video just like what the TV networks used to the public. I'm also including Compact VHS's release in 1980 on the timeline, since it was arguably a massive improvement in usability. With this new info, suddenly the consumer hasn't just been sitting on their hands from the 60s through to the 80s. Suddenly the consumer has had access to television technology almost as long as the industry has. Sure, what you could get in 69 didn't hold a candle to professional TV, but that's still pretty much the case. Early home video also arguably didn't compare favorably to film home movies in some ways. Color did get added to the EIAJ standard eventually, but I don't think many people owned those machines, so you could say that portable home video didn't really get color until the VHS era, which is a bummer to be sure. And film, at least 16mm film, was higher resolution than video, but for the average amateur that's not nearly as important as the advantages that video brought, which you can see through the way it was used. Film forced you to think harder about what you were shooting. If you look at film home movies, they're always assembled out of little clips, sometimes only a second or two long, because film was at a premium, so you shot only long enough to get an event and then stopped. Compare this to home video. EIAJ tapes were one hour from the get-go. VHS expanded the runtime of video to four and six and eight hours, and if you look at people's raw videotape footage, they often just hit the button and let it rip, sometimes for half an hour. A film home movie of a birthday party might be a pile of disjointed clips of a child laughing or a person pulling the wrapping off of one present, but when we hit the video era, people just wander around the house rolling tape, sometimes out into the garage, out into the street, back into the house, and of course that means at any moment something could happen that you wouldn't know about before it happened, but because the camera was already running, you got it on tape. And if all that time was wasted, just rewind and re-record. <laughs> 
The compromises of tape were acceptable to many in exchange for all that freedom. So despite these limitations, we can say that video for the everyman had definitely begun by the 60s and solidified in the 70s. And while we seem to have forgotten that most of this happened, some people at the time recognized that it was going to be, or at least should have been, a really big deal. Take the Video Freaks, for instance, who were a group of New York artists whose founders ran into each other toting video cameras at Woodstock. They thought that video could be a way to democratize the medium of television. Then, as now, the airwaves were dominated by big TV networks, and countercultural distrust of those media outlets was in full swing. I don't have a lot of primary sources from this era, but distrust of the media in the 70s was at a fever pitch, even compared to now. I like using the movie Network from 1976 as an example of how far that distrust would go. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And when the 12th largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force, Force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. I'm sure this perception of an immense power imbalance was nothing new to the counterculture, even in 69, but the leveling of the field that the Porta Pack seemed to offer must have felt tremendous. Television production equipment had always been unfathomably expensive, but this new portable equipment was accessible to consumers, if you could get some money together or had rich parents. The video freaks felt it would enable them to compete with the networks. So they went out shooting their own news stories and documentaries and shows, at first just to pass around, but later to broadcast from a pirate television station they built in Lanesville, New York. I think someone gifted them the broadcast gear since that never came in a cheap consumer variant, but the porta packs certainly made the gathering of footage itself vastly easier and more affordable, the same way the explosion of cheap digital cameras in the 2000s made photography far more accessible to the masses. A lot of the Video Freaks footage is still around, so we can see what it was like. Hi folks in Lanesville, uh, it's May 18th, 1974, and we have another edition of Lanesville TV for you. We have a couple tapes for you, it's going to be a pretty short show, so it would be good if we can get as much community input as possible, uh, otherwise we're not going to be a half hour tonight. We have two tapes, one is of the truck wreck on 23A in Haynes Falls, truck wreck on 23A. Okay, we've just learned from police chief of uh, Hunter Gerald Gerard, uh, that there were two men in the truck, neither of them were hurt. Uh, this is unofficial so far. The official report will be filed tonight. Uh, the co-driver was asleep, and it happened about 2 o'clock last night. And uh, I guess they're both fine now, so that's lucky. Anything else? Any other details? If you're curious, there's a documentary called Here Come the Video Freaks, which you can rent on YouTube to see a lot more of their work. It wasn't as well produced as what the networks were broadcasting. It was black and white, of course, and from what I've seen, poorly shot, edited, and produced. And more importantly, the performances seemed largely atrocious. But it was American television made with zero input from American media, and that is a big accomplishment. The fact you've probably never heard of them is maybe evidence they didn't have the impact they hoped for, but at the same time, here I am making what they wanted everyone to make, independent video art. Even if you could call them unsuccessful, I'd almost just call them unnecessary. Video was slated to become a massive medium, and they just happened to be willing to put in the effort before it was convenient. Beginning in 1970, there was actually an entire periodical called Radical Software, in which people talked about the great things they would accomplish with this technology, which they seem to universally refer to as half-inch video, probably because EIAJ1 was a real mouthful. This magazine told you all about the big changes that television access would bring to the public, shared grand plans to make better news than the networks made, and gave you access to a community. You could send away for a half-inch videotape telling you about poverty in Vancouver, or participate in a novel public access program in New Brunswick, or help document how the 74 World's Fair was going to screw over Spokane. There was also technical info on how to edit video and modify your machine, and naturally, given the time in the community in question, loads of absolute nonsense made while totally twisted on acid. I've also found info about several women's lib groups that felt that video could be a medium for disseminating feminist ideals, but info on them is hard to find. Certainly an element of that might be that men chose not to write them into their histories, but the fact we can't find any of their video footage or even much in the way of published info other than a couple flyers suggests these groups didn't become self-sustaining. This is particularly interesting to me, since early video equipment was marketed pretty hard to women, with ads portraying even these gigantic early machines as easy to use and graceful to be seen with. And you think a lot of hobby groups might have popped up that would have been fantastic places for women to organize and communicate, but as far as I can tell, very little of that happened. We'd find out later in the YouTube era that having access to the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world doesn't mean the good people of the world will be the loudest voices using it, or that decency and truth will be the things people want to see on it.
We can all make our own television now, much better than what the video freaks were producing, globally accessible and legal to boot, and yet Fox News remains the primary source of information for an enormous number of people. Plenty of YouTubers turned out to be egregious liars whose viewers know they're lying and love it, and most people making videos seem to just make junk. You have to admit, though, it does beat the alternative. Well, that's the story I wanted to share. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed or even threw me a couple bucks on coffee. I'm not trying to become YouTube famous or rich, but it's hard to work without any kind of feedback. So I'd be grateful for anything you can offer to help me stay motivated, especially with the way the world is right now. Either way, I hope you had a good time and thanks for watching. Anything else? Any other details?